you know, everyone's interested. What, what, how would I know if I see an alien and if he abducts me? Well, you have, first, the, the first question you have to ask is how many species are there? And uh, I used to think there were, you know, between two and 12. And uh, Apollo astronaut um, uh, Edgar Mitchell, who came to Toronto a, a few years ago and had dinner with us, <coughs> agreed there was somewhere between two and 12. But the latest reports that I've been getting from various sources are that there are about 80 different species. And some of them uh, look just like us, and they could walk down the street and you wouldn't uh, know if you ran, you know, walked past one. Um, and they're what we call the Nordic blondes, and also the tall whites, um, who are actually working with the United States Air Force in Nevada. They, uh, they're able to get away with that. They had a couple of their ladies dressed as nuns went into Las Vegas to shop, and they weren't detected. And I have a friend who saw one of the men walking along the street, and he, somebody who would recognize uh, uh, that they were different, and he did. So there are those kind, and then there are the, the short grays, as they're called. And they're the ones that you see in most of the cartoons. They very, have very, very slim arms and legs, and they're very short, just uh, you know, a little over five feet. And they have a great big uh, torso and, uh, and a, great big, a great big head and, and great big brown eyes. But <clears throat> they're, they're different species, so you have to, uh, to know that they're different species and, it's, uh, and, and know that they're all different. Mm -hmm. So, so one, uh, if, you, if you saw the short gray, if you saw the short grays, you'd certainly know that there was something up that you'd never seen before. But if you saw one of the Nordic blondes, well, you'd probably say, oh, I wonder if she's from, uh, from Denmark or, uh, or somewhere, you know. So this species that you're describing, are, are they all different in terms of nice and mean? Uh, are some of them nice and benevolent? Are others nasty? Or, 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 or how are they? Are, they? are they good to people on Earth, or are they here to harm them? Well, it's a difficult question to answer because they're, they have different agendas. And maybe all of us on Earth have this, should have the same agenda, but you couldn't say maybe that, that Russia and China and the United States all had the same agenda at every, every turn because they don't. And I would say that nearly all are benign, they're benevolent, they want to help us. There may be one or two species which do not. And uh, that's one of the things I'm investigating at the moment is to see who they are and what they're up to and uh, what their agendas really are. All right, we're talking to Paul Hellier, former Canadian Minister of Defense, who says extraterrestrial life forms exist and are present on Earth. We'll talk more about what they are and why they're here after a short break. Stay with us. Antarctica, the crew of the Academic Fyodorov face many challenges. Here you have to look out for yourself. Crashing onto rocks, trapped in pack ice, in extreme conditions, anything can happen. Antarctica always comes up with surprises. You have to keep your eyes open because there's always something going wrong. The ship carries huge reserves of water, food, fuel, as well as helicopters and people able to survive extreme conditions. They're ready for anything, even an apocalypse. She's really an incredible ship. Calling all Antarctica stations. This is Akademik Fyodorov. Radio check. Please respond. Unexplored Antarctica. What is it in this icy expanse that attracts the people who come here? Now I only go to the dacha. 
<laughs> and Antarctica. A new generation of polar explorers is coming. We have a new group of specialists here now. All of them are young. How are they going to get along with each other? I don't know. Who are they? I used to be a bureaucrat. Seriously. What adventures await in this mysterious land? Where do they live? What do they eat? And what are they actually doing in Antarctica? Twelve months of change. The moments which redefine the world we live in. RT was there to bring you the full picture. Clash with the police. The police are holding their own and boy to close a camp that is a dark spot on America. Build the barricades which the police had taken down. In on New Year's Eve, our global, global team of reporters and contributors revisit the key events of 2013 and outline what to expect next. Join Anissa Nawi and Kevin Owen for our annual two-hour news special. Start 2014 with RT. your former Canadian Minister of Defence to talk about extraterrestrial life forms. Great to have you back. So, these extraterrestrial creatures, where did they come from and how did they get here to Earth? They come from ver various places. For a long while, um, I only knew about ones who came from different star systems. Um, the Pleiades and uh, Reta Reticula and uh, several other star systems, but in the last few months, I have met people who have made me aware of uh, that there are some in our star system and that there are actually extraterrestrials um, who live on a, a planet called Andromedia, which is one of the moons of Saturn, and that there are others on, uh, on Venus and some on Mars, and uh, that uh, they may be interacting between themselves. I suspect that they are because there is what is called a federation of, uh, of these people and they have rules. For example, one of the rules is that they don't interfere in our affairs unless they're invited to. And uh, that's one of the reasons uh, probably that we haven't seen more of them uh, until very recently. And. Uh, so but what do you mean? There are a lot of people who want to interact they, with them. There are a lot of people who actually want to see them and know who they are. Uh, what they need a special invitation to inter interact with us? W what does it mean? They don't want to interfere into I our think affairs. They have to, well, they, they don't want to tell us how to run our affairs. They have, have accepted the fact this is our planet and that we have the right to run it. But um, they're very, very concerned. They, th they don't think we're good stewards of our planet. We're not, uh, we're cutting, uh, clear cutting our forests and we're uh, polluting our rivers and our lakes and we're dumping sewage in the oceans and we're doing all sorts of things which are not what good stewards of their homes uh, should be doing and they don't like that and they've made it very clear and as a matter of fact they have given us a warning. How? And this has come from more than one source. What well, how have they um, made it clear? Well, what have they done? They have talked to uh, people. Uh, one of the chaps I talked to about a month ago was, uh, was interacting with them in 1974, he and his brother in Peru, and uh, they were taken to Andromedia, uh, teleported, and, uh, and they were told uh, what the people there think and uh, that we're really uh, wrecking our planet and in fact that something dreadful is going to happen to it if we don't smarten up and change our ways. We spend too much time fighting each other, we spend too much money on military expenditures and not enough on feeding the poor and, uh, and looking after the homeless and the sick and uh, that we are uh, polluting our, our waters and our air and that we're playing around with these uh, exotic weapons uh, thermonuclear weapons and uh, atomic, we atomic weapons 
which have such a devastating effect both on our Earth and on other areas in the cosmos, and, uh, and they don't like that. And that's the reason they would like to work with us to teach us better ways, but uh, only, I think, with our consent. And they work through individuals, and they try and pick out individuals who won't be frightened to death of them, mm -hmm. because they can give you quite a fright. Uh, one of the cases I'm familiar with was the, the tall whites in Nevada, where the United States Airmen working with them uh, you know, were just frightened to death of them. And one, Charles Hall, uh, rescued the daughter of one of the high up uh, people in the, in the tall whites, and as a result became very good friends with the mother. And, uh, and as soon as they could trust each other, they had a wonderful relationship. But, and he wrote a book about it, it's called uh, Millennial Hospitality. Mm -hmm. Millennial Hospitality. And uh, it's, it tells you how you go through these stages of being scared out of your wits, but then this, when you establish a trust and a working relationship, why you can have the same relationship, uh, same kind of relationship that you would have with someone here on Earth. But here's what I'm thinking. If you're outing their presence, which is clearly not what they want since they're hiding, why aren't they? Why, you know, why aren't they so afraid of? Why aren't you afraid of repercussions? Because you're obviously stating that they're here among us, well, and I'm you're telling me all these species that exist. That they are here among us, and I'm not afraid because, in most cases, uh, well, as far as uh, technology is concerned, they're light years ahead of us, and we have learned a lot of things from them. A lot of the things that we use today, we got from them. Uh, you know, uh, uh, lead lights and uh, microchips and uh, Kevlar uh, vests and uh, all sorts of things that we got from their technology. And we could get a lot more too, especially in the fields of medicine and agriculture, if we would, uh, if we would go about it peacefully. But um, I think maybe some of our people are, are more interested in getting their their military technology, and I think that's that's wrong. I think that's wrong-headed, and that's one of the things that uh, that we're going to have to change because we're going to have to work together. Talking about uh, all of us everywhere on the planet. You mentioned military technology and swapping technologies and barters between inter in, in between aliens and uh, people in American government. I want to ask you, as a former Minister of Defense of Canada. Is interstellar war a possibility? Should we be creating a Star Wars force to defend ourselves from possible invasion or something like that? Well, I think it's a possibility, but it's a possibility, especially if we uh, if we shoot down every uh, UFO that comes in our in our airspace without asking who they are or what they're what they want. And right from the beginning, we started scrambling planes and trying to shoot them down but their technology was superior enough that we weren't able to uh, get away with it, uh, certainly not uh, for a long while. And during that period of time, they could have taken us over without any trouble if they'd wanted to. So uh, I, th I think we have to, uh, rather than develop our own Star Wars, for Earth Star Wars, to, uh, to protect ourselves against them, that we should, we should uh, work with the benign of species who are the vast majority and, uh, and work together and rely largely on them, of course, and cooperate so that the, we would be uh, contributing something at the same time. But uh, I don't think there's any, any point in us uh, developing a, a galactic uh, force that um, would tempt us to go out on our own and get into mischief, which is one of the things I think some of them are concerned about. But what do you expect to happen if people start to believe in alien existence on Earth? Because things are definitely going to change. Our lives aren't going to be the same anymore. Well, I hope that's the case. I, I hope that's the case. And I'm, uh, I'm all for full disclosure. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to push very hard for a full disclosure in the book I'm writing and to give some reasons for it. Uh, things that we really have to know and uh, have a right to know, and that our future as a species, and here I mean you know, all of the species on the world, in the world, um, are p 
potentially at risk if we don't figure out 